let's look at the eye. And this is our lecture guide. By the end of this class, we should be able to describe the structures of the external eye, the structures that are embedded within the internal eye, the chambers and cavities of the eye, the fluid compartments, the lacrimal gland, blood supply, and some clinical anatomy. The eye is a specialized sense organ that is used for vision. It receives visual rays from objects that are located in the external environment. So you have light rays from objects outside the eye passing through it. And of course, it does undergo some form of processing before the optic nerve finally picks it up and direct it to the brain where interpretation will occur. So we have the high being divided structurally into two regions. We have the external high, which is a part of the high that is seen on the outside. Then we have the internal high, the compartments that are located within the high balls. And this is the presentation of what we see within the interiors of the high. The external high and the internal high can, of course, be linked together. There are some structures that are seen on the outside that can also be represented on the inside. But as we follow suit with this lecture, we would be able to see how the high is represented with structures located on the outside and also on the inside. So the external high is what we'll be looking at now, and that is the visible part of the high. So this is what you see when you look at the highs from the outside. And the first structure I would want to highlight is the eyebrow. This is like a collection of hair mass that is located at the superior angle of the eye. What this does basically is to prevent structures from entering into the eye. So it's like it forms a kind of barricade to prevent substances from draining into the eye. Then we have the upper eyelid. The upper eyelid is a fold of membrane that is seen at the superior margin of the high. Then we have the lower high lid, which is a fold of membrane that is seen at the inferior margin of the high. So on top of the margin, we have eyelashes. So we have the lower eyelashes, which are hairlines seen along the lower border of the high. Then we have upper hairline seen at the upper high lid. So they help to trap dust or unwanted substances, thereby preventing them from entering into the highs. Then we have the sclera. The sclera is the white part of the high. If you look at the anterior configuration of the high, you see that there's a white part on the lateral and the medial side of the high, and that is the sclera. Also to add that the sclera extends to the posterior part of the high, and of course, as we follow suit with this lecture, we would be able to see the configuration of the sclera. Then we have the high risk. The high risk is the dark round region of the high, and you see it is a rounded shaped structure that is located at the center of the high. If you view its visible part, then we have the pupil. The pupil is a deeper round region that is embedded within the iris. We see an outer rounded space that is called the iris, and we see a deeper rounded space that is called the pupil. Then we have the caruncle, the pinkish body that is seen around the medial side of the high. So you see that pinkish structure that is located around the medial region of the high. When you view it from the outside, this structure contains oil and sweat gland. They tend to secrete substances that helps to moisturize the high and also keep the high free from germs and infection. We have the medial cantus. The medial cantus is where the upper high lid and the lower high lid meet at the medial side. Then we have the lateral cantus, which is where the upper high lid and the lower high lid meet at the lateral side. So this is the entire configuration of the visible part of the high. So this is what we see in clear terms when we view the high from the outside. Also to hard is the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is a thin transparent membrane that that extends over the sclera and also run below the interior wall of the upper and the lower eyelid. So we have the conjunctiva, the thin membrane overlining the sclera, then going further upward to line the interiors of the upper eyelid and also downwards to line the interiors of the lower eyelid. So the conjunctiva is therefore divided into two parts. We have the palpebral conjunctiva, which is the part of the conjunctiva that lines the inferior walls of the upper and the lower eyelid. 
Then we have the bulbar conjunctiva, which is the region of the conjunctiva that lines over the sclera. So this is what you see on the outside. So the conjunctiva is just limited to the sclera. It does not cover over the iris and the pupil. Looking at this picture, the area highlighted in red is the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva running over the anterior region of the sclera, then folding to be continuous with the interior walls of the eyelid. So this is the upper eyelid, this is the lower eyelid, and these are the eyelashes. So you have the sclera, the anterior part, this is the region that can be seen on the outside. You can see the conjunctiva lining over this space. It does not extend over to the posterior wall. It's just limited to the anterior part of the eye. Then it folds to be continuous by lining onto the inferior walls of the upper and the lower eyelid. What this means is that the palpebral part of the conjunctiva and the bulbar part of the conjunctiva are actually continuous. There is no breakage. So it lines the anterior part, then it further goes to line the inferior part of the eyelid. This is the palpebral part of the conjunctiva, and this is the bulbar part of the conjunctiva that lines over the anterior region of the sclera. So a bit more on the conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is basically made up of two sets of epithelium. We have the stratified squamous epithelium and the stratified columnar epithelium. If you've gone through our lecture on the epithelium, we'll see what stratification is all about. Stratification basically are protective in function, while columnar epithelium are secretory. So what happens is that the stratification region present protective function, while the regions that are lined with stratified columnar epithelium secrete antibacterial and water proteinous agents that helps to lubricate the eye. So what the conjunctiva does is to protect the eyes against infection and also helps to lubricate the eye. This membrane, of course, can be infected. And when they are infected with either a bacteria or a virus, it causes a pinkish coloration of the high, and this is termed conjunctivitis. It can also be referred to as a polo. So if this red highlighted structure is infected, which is termed conjunctivitis, there's going to be a pinkish coloration of the high. And this is very contagious. It can easily be transmitted from one person to another. So going through the internal compartment of the eye, this is the region of the eye that we see from the inside. It is basically arranged in three layers. So we have three distinct layers of the internal compartment of the eye. The first one is the fibrous tunic, which is the most outer part of the eye. Then the second middle layer is the vascular tunic, which is of course located between the outer and the inner layer. Then we have the neural or the sensory tunic which is the innermost layer. We would be taking these layers one after the other to see what they represent and what their functions are. So the fibrous tunic is also referred to as the coniosclera coat, which is the most external layer of the high. It is like a fibrous capsule that covers the entire high ball. And this is what they present. They can also be further subdivided into two. We have the sclera. The sclera occupies like five over six of the entire fibrous tunic layer, and it is seen from the anterior part of the eye, and of course, extending to the posterior part of the eye. Then the second subdivision is the cornea. The cornea takes about one sixth of the entire fibrous tunic. Encircling the entire high bone is the fibrous tunic on the outside. But this is continuous, of course. So at different regions, they are being given different names. So from this region, down to this region is the cornea. And the cornea is located on the external part of the eye. So the cornea can only be viewed on the external part of the eye. Why the sclera, of course, extends from the external part of the eye, then goes behind the posterior region of the eye. The sclera takes about five over six of the entire circumference, while the cornea takes about one over six of the entire circumference of the fibrous tunic. So let's take the sclera and the cornea. Let's see what they look like and what they do to support the high. So for the sclera, the sclera is the white part of the high. It is a tough, dense connective tissue layer that is basically made up of collagen, elastic, and melanocytes. And what they do is to help maintain the shape of the high. Because of course, they are seen on the outside, they help to maintain the shape that the high ball presents. They also help to give strength and support 
to the high because they are made up of collagen fibers which present a high tensile strength and through that they are able to give support in terms of strength to the high ball. They also help to prevent the penetration of substances into the intraocular space. This is the intraocular space. This is the space that is located within the high ball. And this is the sclera. So it helps to prevent the penetration of structures into the high, because we still have a lot of structures that are embedded within this space. So what the sclera does is to give structural boundaries or limit, for, of course, prevent them from entering into the hive. The sclera also create attachment point for extraocular muscles. We have muscles that helps to connect the high balls to the surrounding bones, and there is no other space within the hive that this muscle will be attached to other than the sclera. So this is the sclera. You can see the extraocular muscle, the rectus and the oblique muscles are of course attached to the sclera before they are inserted on the surrounding bones around the socket. Let's do a bit of histology. Looking at the layers of the sclera, the sclera is made up of four distinct layers. We have the episclera. This is the episclera. It is made up of dense fibrous tissue. Then we have the second layer, which is the sclera proper. This is what makes the bulk of the sclera. It is made up of collagen fibers. We say that it gives tensile strength, and it is this region that is able to facilitate the execution of that function. Then we have the lamina fusca. This is a deep pigmented layer, and it's located deep to the sclera proper. Then we have the last layer, which is the endothelial layer, and the type of epithelium that you see here, simple squamous epithelium. Then the cornea, we've said that it forms like one sixth of the entire surface of the fibrous tunic, and this is the cornea. You can see it's an anterior extension of the sclera. This is the sclera, this is the cornea. So it's like one of assist of the entire circumference. The cornea, if we look at it from this image, we see that it is transparent. And it is transparent because it is non-pigmented. And its transparency, of course, would be able to allow easy penetration of light rays, because this is where we have the iris and we have the pupil down. So this is like the rounded dark part of the eye that we see in the external view. And this is now overlined with the cornea. If the cornea is pigmented, light ray may not be able to pass through it. So one of the justification of it not pigmented is for it to allow light ray to pass through it. So light ray can pass through and enter into the people to go into the interiors of the eye where further processing will occur. Also a bit more on the histology of the cornea. The cornea is made up of five distinct layers. We have three cellular layer and two acellular layer. And the way they are aligned is that they alternate. So we have a cellular layer on top. We have an acellular layer below. We have a cellular layer on top. We have an acellular layer below. And that's the way it goes. So let's look at the five layers of the cornea. The first layer is the outer layer. And this is made up of a stratified squamous epithelium because it's like a protective gadget that is seen overlining the iris. Of course, stratification can be justified here. So it stratifies squamous epithelium, although it is not keratinized. That is what you see on the outer layer of the cornea. Then deep to that, we see a membrane. We see that when we have a cellular layer, the next layer we have is an acellular layer. So the acellular layer we have is the Bowman's layer and this, of course, is where the epithelium rests on. Then we have the third layer, the cornea stroma. The cornea stroma forms the entire thickness of the cornea. Then we have the next layer, which is the acellular layer. And this, of course, underline the cornea stroma. And this is termed the desetment membrane, after which we now have an underlining endothelial layer, which, of course, is cellular. And this is made up of a single layer of squamous epithelium. Sometimes we may see a simple cuboidal epithelium. Then it's good for us to know the scleroconeal junction. From the name, we have already said that the sclera and the cornea are continuous. So there will be a junction whereby they meet. So the region where they actually form a link is called the link bus. The limb bus is like a transition zone. This is where you have the cornea because we say it overlies the iris and the pupil. And this is where we have the sclera. 
So this region is where we have the limbus, where the sterics become continuous with the cornea. It can also be presented here with this lower image. This is the sclera, this is the cornea. At this point is the point where they meet, and this is the sclerocornea junction. Then the second layer is the vascular tunic. The vascular tunic is the middle layer and of course it's situated between the outer and the inner layer. This is a pigmented layer and this layer can further be subdivided into three. We have the choroid, we have the ciliary body and we have the iris. So if you see this pigmented layer that is underlining the fibrous tunic, it is called the vascular tunic, and that is why it is highlighted in blue color. This region, of course, extends. If you see the way it runs, when it gets to this anterior margin, there's a form of transformation that we see here. Okay, so this is the choroid. Then we have the ciliary body. On the anterior part, we see that the choroid runs and it has become transformed into another structure. And this is termed the ciliary body. Then we have another one, the iris, that is located anterior to the ciliary body. So it's just a single layer. But of course, when they get to specific region, they become transformed to specific structures. So let's look at the subdivisions of the vascular tunic one after the other to see what they present. For the choroid, this is the choroid and it is made up of loose connective tissue. Of course, we see that the line below the sclera, this structure is rich in blood supply and that is why you have its dark brown coloration. So it gives like 80% of the blood flow to the high and it helps to provide nutrients for the structures that are embedded within the high. For the ciliary body, the ciliary body is like an inward extension of the choroid. We said that the choroid become continuous on the anterior side, there's a form of transformation. So you can see the extension that it forms, but at the level of the lens is where you see this extension. And this is called the ciliary body. This is the region where they are located. The component of the ciliary body, the ciliary body is divided first into two main regions. We have the pars plana and we have the pars placata. The pars plana is a flat extension of the ciliary region that extends from the choroid, while a deeper region of the ciliary body that is seen with processes is called the pars placata. Looking at the structural component of the ciliary body, we have three major structures. We have the ciliary muscle, which is located on the outside, is actually strands that is seen at the outer part of the ciliary body. Then we have the ciliary process, which is a finger-like process that is seen around the pars placata. Lying over the ciliary process, we have the ciliary epithelium. The function of this epithelium is that they secrete aqueous humor, which is contained within the internal cavity of the eyeball. If you take the eyeball and you press it, you see that fluid usually comes out from the eye. Looking more on the ciliary body, there are actually structures that are related to the ciliary body. There are structures, of course, that are not part of the vascular tunic but they give a form of relation or linkage to the ciliary body. And that is the suspensory ligament. The suspensory ligament is like a fibrous tissue that attaches to the lens. So it is connected from the ciliary process to the lens. So you have the lens at this region, but the lens are not directly linked to the ciliary process, but are connected to the suspensory ligament. Why the suspensory ligament is connected to the ciliary body. So that's the way it runs. So that's the suspensory ligament. Then we also have the lens itself. The lens is a transparent, a vascular biconvex structure that is suspended by the suspensory ligament. So we say we have the lens that is being held in place along its equator by the suspensory ligament. You can see like the link that exists between the lens the suspensory ligament and the ciliary body. So whatever events that occur within the ciliary muscle, we definitely have an impact on the action that the suspensory ligament will present. And also this will have a concurrent effect on the lens. And this will be discussed further in the course of this lecture. So this is the lens. So what is now the function of this lens? What do they do? in respect to the movement of light ray. When light ray enters through from the external environment, it has to pass through the cornea. 
we've said that the cornea is transparent. Of course, this will allow the passage of light ray and it goes in and strike on the lens. When it strike on the lens, because it's coming from one medium to the other, there's going to be refraction and the light ray will then be refracted by the lens. And this refraction will be collected on the wall of the retina. So basically, the function of the lens is to help refract light ray that is coming from the outside. Component of the lens. The lens is made up of three basic structures. We have the lens capsule. The lens capsule is the most outer part, and it is made up of a smooth, transparent membrane. They are elastic. They are able to alter the shape of the lens. Then the second layer is the epithelial layer. The epithelium of the lens is simple cuboidal epithelium. And of course, this is located deep to the lens capsule. And what they do, because cuboidal epithelium have secretory function, is they have to synthesize proteins. And the last layer is the lens fiber, and this forms the bulk of the lens. And of course, it is located deep to the lens epithelium. And the kind of structures that are embedded within this space are crystalline proteins. These crystalline proteins have the capacity to break over time and become deposited on the surface of the lens. And this is what leads to cataracts. This will also be discussed during the course of this lecture. This is an important fact for us to know in discussing the morphology of the eye. We have the process that is termed accommodation. Accommodation is the process whereby light ray coming from the outside are well refracted on the surface of the retina. There are times that refraction occur in front of the retina. And of course, there are times that refraction occur and the images will be deposited behind the retina. But when refracted light rays are deposited on the retina, it is the normal phenomenon and this is called accommodation. But how does accommodation come to play? It is the activity that occurs from the ciliary body and also the suspensory ligament. We've talked about this in our previous slide. We've said that the ciliary body helps to connect the suspensory ligament with the lens. So when there is contraction or relaxation, any form of action that the ciliary muscle is able to undergo, it will definitely affect the action of this suspensory ligament. There by altering the shape of the lens. And when the shape is altered, it's just to suit light ray pattern that is coming from the outside so that they can well be refracted on the retina and not in front or behind the retina. When it is collected on the retina, it is termed accommodation. What are the functions of the ciliary body? The ciliary body, we've highlighted that on the ciliary process, we have epithelium that are lined over it, and this epithelium secretes aqueous humor, which helps to provide nutrients for the internal structures that are embedded within the heart. Then the second function will now be the accommodation because any action that they exhibit will affect the suspensory ligament. And this will have a concurrent effect on the shape of the lens. And this can determine whether the refracted light ray will be focused on the retina in front of it or behind it. So when it is well focused on the retina, it is called accommodation. We said that the vascular tunic is made up of three parts. We have the choroid, we have the ciliary body, then the last one is the iris. The iris is a muscular extension of the vascular tunic and it extends over the ciliary body. And what it does is that it helps to control the diameter and size of the pupil. It is actually this iris that forms a space that is called the pupil. So we have the iris extending downward, but of course does not extend along the entire plane. You also have iris going upward, but does not extend along the entire plane. So the two structures here now gives a space, like an aperture in between them. And this space is called the pupil. And this is the iris. So what this aperture does is to allow light ray that is coming from the external environment passes through the cornea. We already said the cornea is transparent, so it will allow light ray to pass through it. So when it gets here, of course, there's a free will here. There's a space. Nothing is blocking the light so that light ray can pass through it and strike directly on the lens for refraction to take place. So this space created here is created by the iris. The iris, of course, have been used to determine the pigmentation of the eye. So the color of the iris 
can be black, can be brown, can be blue. So any color that it takes, it's used to project the color of one's high. So that is another relevance of the iris. The iris itself is further subdivided into two muscular components. We have the dilator papillae and we have the sphincter papillae. The dilator papillae is also referred to as the radial muscle. It is on the outside and it is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. And this helps to dilate the pupil. In response to fright or flight mode, an emergency state, there's going to be dilation of the pupil. And this will be controlled by the radial muscle. While the sphincter papillae is located deeper to the radial muscle, and what it does is to constrict the pupil. And this, of course, occurs during a parasympathetic situation. The iris can be divided into two major regions. We have the pupillary region, which is the central region, and of course the region that is close to the pupil. Then we have the ciliary region, which is the remaining part that is located upward, and of course is the region that is close to the ciliary body. And this is the ciliary zone. The neural tunic, which is the most innermost layer, this layer, what it is made up of is the retina. So it's the deepest layer. We know that the retina is a layered structure. It is found lying deep to the choroid layer, which is the middle vascular tunic layer. It is called sensory tunic because it is at this point that the neural impulses, that is the sensory or afferent impulses are collected and of course are directed through the optic nerve to the brain. The choroid is able to supply blood to the retina because it is very active and needs to be well supplied with blood. The aura serrata is important for us to note this region. Remember when we talked about the vascular tunic, we said there is a choroid we say there is a ciliary body and there is an iris. There is a region that the retina become continuous with the ciliary body. This is the ciliary body. So we have a continuation point at this region that is called the aura serrata. In this region, there is a very sharp transition between a photosensitive layer, which is the retina, and the ciliary layer. These do not contain photosensitive cells. Then we have the layers of the retina. We said that is a layer structure. It is made up of a number of layers. The first one is the retina pigment layer, and this is made up of a single layer of cuboidal cell. Then we have the photoreceptor layer that is made up of the root and the cones. We have the external limiting layer, the outer nuclear layer, the outer plexiform layer, inner nuclear layer, the inner plexiform layer, the ganglion cell layer, nerve fiber layer, and the last layer, the inner limiting layer. So these are all the layers of the retina. Photoreceptor layer is the second layer and it is filled with the roots and the cones. The roots function in dim light while the cones function in the daytime light. So the roots can process only black and white images while the cones process color images. The cavities and chambers of the eye. We have the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. The anterior chamber is the space that is located anterior to the iris. So it's located between the cornea and the iris. Then we have the posterior chamber that is located from the posterior region of the iris to the anterior surface of the lens. So we have the anterior chamber here, we have the posterior chamber here. The anterior and the posterior chamber forms the anterior cavity of the eye, and this is filled with aqueous humor. We already said that the aqueous humor is secreted by the epithelium lining over the ciliary process. Then we have the posterior cavity at the back. So we have the anterior cavity that is made up of the anterior chamber and posterior chamber, and we have the posterior cavity behind the lens, and this is filled with vitreous humor. So these are the cavities of the eye. Then we have the fluid compartment. Of course, within the cavities, they are not just empty, they are filled with fluid. So the fluid that is seen in the anterior cavity is the aqueous humor, while in the posterior cavity, we have the vitreous humor. The aqueous humor helps to bait the lens and, of course, provide nutrients for it. While the vitreous humor helps to transmit light rays, vitreous humor on this part helps in the transmission of the refracted light ray 
to be focused on the retina. It also helps to keep the retina in position within this space. So it helps to keep it in place so that when the light ray comes, it can be well focused on them. Then they also help to maintain intraocular pressure. There are pressures that should be maintained within the interiors of the eye. So when there's over secretion of this fluid, it's going to alter the pressure and it can affect the structures that are located around this region, which precisely is the optic nerve. The optic nerve, the optic nerve is uh, a collection of tracts that extend from the eye, collecting the neural signal and transmitting them to the brain where analysis will occur. We also have a region that is called the optic disc. The optic disc is like the root of the optic nerve or where the optic nerve emerges from. And in this region, we have the void of photoreceptors. So you can see that the retina does not extend towards this region. Within this region is where we have the optic disc. And from the optic disc, we have the emergence of the optic nerve to the brain where further analysis and interpretation will be done. It's also good for us to have an idea of what this means. The fovea is like a tiny pit that is located within the wall of the retina. So you can see this indentation. When light rays are refracted, they are refracted directly on the photosensitive layer. So this photosensitive layer just traps it in and is able to provide a very clear and sharp image because the light rays are focused or directed on the photosensitive layer because of the indentation that is created. Then we have the lacrimal gland. The lacrimal gland is a serous compound tubular arsenic gland that is located around the lateral part of the eye. So it is seen at the lateral upper region of the eye. They secrete serous, which means that they secrete watery substance that is referred to as tears. And the basic component of the tears that is being secreted by the lacrimal gland is lysosome. This lysosome is an antimicrobial agent that tends to protect the eyes against infection. Question to ask now is, when last did you cry? In order to enjoy the advantages that the tears bring to the eyes, it is also important for us to know that there is a lacrimal apparatus. The lacrimal apparatus is made up of a number of structures through which the tear secreted by the lacrimal gland runs through to be able to enter into the nasal cavity. So this is the lacrimal gland. The secret is released through a dot, which is called the lacrimal dot. So this is the lacrimal dot. But because it is located at the lateral part of the eye, and the lacrimal apparatus are located around the medial side of the eye because the nasal cavity is around this space, it needs to run across to the medial side of the eye so that the tears can pass through this gadget before it finally drains into the nasal cavity. So tears is released through the lacrimal dots. It enters into the lateral part of the eye because that's the region where it is located. Then they run through the medial side and they enter through the punctum. The punctum is like a hole that is seen around the medial side of the eye. We have the upper and the lower punctum. So they enter through it. And the next place that they go to is the canaliculi. So we have the upper and the lower canaliculi before they now finally drain into a common canaliculi. They go further downward and they enter into the lacrimal sac. From the lacrimal sac, they go through the nasolacrimal dot. When they run through the nasolacrimal dot, they are now emptied into the nasal cavity by releasing their content around the inferior meatus. So that is how the tear that is secreted by the lacrimal gland on the lateral side of the eye become drained through the lacrimal apparatus for them to finally empty into the nasal cavity. Blood supply of the eye. The blood supply of the eye comes from the ophthalmic artery. The ophthalmic artery is a branch of the internal carotid artery. Remember our lecture on the internal carotid when we talked about the cerebral part of the internal carotid artery. We said it gives off a number of branches before it finally terminates into the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. So one of the branches it gives off before finally terminating is the ophthalmic artery. And of course, this runs to the high region to supply the high blood. There are divisions that it gives to supply the high. So the first one is the central retina artery, and this runs along the optic nerve. So you see it running along the optic nerve to supply regions around that space. Then we have the short posterior ciliary artery, which runs to supply the posterior part of the high ball. This does not really run a long course. And we have a longer posterior ciliary artery that runs more anterior. The clinical anatomy, the first one we'll look into it, 
conjunctivitis. This is an infection of the conjunctiva and it's usually caused by a bacteria or a virus. We've talked about the alignment of the conjunctiva and when infected is when we have conjunctivitis. Basic treatment are antibiotic eye drops. If it's bacteria infected conjunctivitis, but if it's viral, it may need to run its course. And of course, we've stated that this is very contagious. Then cataract. Cataract is a cloudy area that is seen on the lens. We've said that the bulk of the lens is made up of crystalline proteins. These proteins, we say they have the tendency of breaking out and being deposited on the surface of the lens. So when this happens, it's going to give a cloudy or a blurry vision. And this can be treated with surgery, whereby the lens is replaced with a clear artificial lens. Or we have glycomia. Glycomia happens when the fluid compartment of the heart builds up and increases the pressure inside the heart. And when this happens, it can damage the optic nerve around that space. Basic treatment, of course, is with high drop that can help lower the secretion or increase its flow. We can use oral medication or lesser treatment or even surgery as the case may be to drain out the fluid. Let's check our understanding through this following question. The first one is to describe the layers of the high using an illustrative diagram. We've stated that they have three distinct layers. Explain the process of accommodation. How does this process occur? Describe the chambers and cavities of the high. We've also explained this extensively in the course of this lecture. Describe the oral serrata and the fovea. This, of course, have been well highlighted. So thanks for watching. Let's continue to stay tuned for more updates.